Sheriff Corey Reese. Hi, Corey. Good. Uh, in recent weeks, our country's police officers have been really under siege. I want to thank uh, — first of all, I do want to thank Vice President Pence for all the work he's done on this, and in particular, Attorney General uh, Bill Barr, because the job he's done has been amazing. It's been uh, — it's been 24 hours a day. I guess I could say 28 hours a day, right? It never ends, but it's uh, been a great job that you've both done. We appreciate it. Mike, we appreciate it very much. But our officers have been under vicious assault, and hundreds of police have been injured and several murdered. You've been reading about it just like I've been seeing it. Reckless politicians have defamed our law enforcement heroes as the enemy. They call them the enemy. They actually go and say they're the enemy and even call them an invading army. These radical politicians want to defund and abolish the police from our nation. At first, when I first heard it, I said, well, uh, that's just something that they're saying that doesn't — but they actually are trying to do it. You look at what's going on in Minneapolis. You look at what's going in uh, many, many Democrat-run areas. Uh, but they want to defund and they want to abolish. Far-left mayors are escalating. The anti-cop crusade and violent crime is spiraling in their cities. It's all far-left cities where they have no understanding of what has to be done. They don't have a clue. And I will say that we put on a very powerful uh, rule and law that uh, you get 10 years, you knock down a monument. If it's a federal monument, you go to jail for 10 years. And if it's uh, anything else, we tell them we work with the states to help them. But if it's — if you do anything where it's a federal monument, and there are a lot of them up there, and nobody's been attacked, nothing's been attacked since we did 10 years in jail, monument or statue. In one recent week in New York City — this is hard to believe — shootings were up 358 percent, and yet uh, they spend all their time. They want to do Black Lives Matter, uh, Matter signs outside of Trump Tower. They ought to spend their time doing something else, because I'll tell you what, 358 percent increase in shootings in New York. Last month, over 300 people were shot. NYPD retirements have quadrupled, and they're going up even further. And New York City is out of control, unfortunately. My place, I love it, but it's out of control. It was doing so well. And Rudy Giuliani, whether you like Rudy or not, he did a great job. He was the greatest mayor in the history of New York. Murders in Atlanta are up 133 percent compared to the same period last year. And one of the victims was an 8-year-old girl. And we've had younger than that in Chicago last weekend. In the last two weeks, 105 Americans were shot in Philadelphia and Minneapolis. The city voted to disband the police department and cut it way down, but disbanded ultimately. The radical politicians are waging war on innocent Americans. That's what you're doing when you play with the police. My administration is pro-safety, pro-police, and anti-crime. And I will say, I just see a new number came in from Chicago. This weekend was a scourge. This weekend was I guess 20 people killed and many, many shootings. Many, many shootings. Far worse than the last week. So things are happening that nobody's ever seen happening — happen in uh, cities that are liberally run. I call them radical lib. And yet, uh, they'll go and uh, march on areas and rip everything down in front of them. If that's what you want for a country, uh, you probably have to vote for sleepy Joe Biden, because he doesn't know what's happening. But uh, you're not going to have it with me. So we've uh, been very strong on law enforcement. We'll be doing things uh, that you'll be, I think, very impressed with. Numbers are going to be coming down, even if we have to go in and take over cities, because we can't let that happen. When you have 20 people killed, 22 people killed in one weekend in Chicago, and you have 88 shootings, it's not even conceivable. That's worse than Afghanistan, I hate to say it. That's worse than any war zone that we're in. Uh, by a lot. It makes them look like tame places by comparison. So we're not going to let it go on. We're not supposed to uh, — supposed to wait for them to call, but they don't call. We've asked uh, Chicago, would you like us to go in and help? And they don't want to say anything. And we've called many of the cities, would you like us to go and help? We've done a great job in Portland. Portland was totally out of control. And uh, they went in, and I guess we have many people right now in jail. And we very much quelled it. 
And if it starts again, we'll quell it again very easily. It's not hard to do if you know what you're doing. So I just want to thank everybody for being here. I'd maybe ask uh, Vice President Pence to say a couple of words, and then uh, I'd like Bill Barr to say something, and we'll go around the room, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. President. It's, um, it's a real privilege to be here uh, with the law enforcement officers who are gathered here and families um, whose lives have been impacted so profoundly by the courageous efforts of men and women in law enforcement. Uh, I can assure you uh, that while some are talking about defunding the police uh, under this president and this administration, we're going to defend the police and we're going to back the blue because we understand that while tragedies happen and we'll always look for ways that we can improve public safety and the president's taken steps and taken executive action to provide new resources to improve public safety and law enforcement around the country uh, i want to assure you that you have a president who knows what the people gathered around this table know is that most of the men and women who put on the uniform of law enforcement every day are the best people in this country uh, they risk their lives every day to make, to make a difference in our communities, just like they've made a difference in all of your lives. And so uh, I want to thank you all. I want to thank you for being here at this, uh, for this conversation, because the American people will greatly benefit by being reminded of the incredible contributions that our law enforcement community makes each and every day. And, and uh, I appreciate your willingness to tell that story. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. First, let me say uh, what an honor it is for me to serve under a president who is such a strong supporter of law enforcement. I've said repeatedly that, to my mind, there is no more noble profession in our country than serving as a law enforcement officer. The police put their lives and well-being on the line every day for us. And their jobs have never been more difficult than it is today. Today, we, are, we suffer many unprecedented social ills. Kids growing up without fathers, alienated young, angry men, gangs engaged in the most brutal kinds of violence, increasing mental illness and homelessness, <clears throat> and a drug epidemic inflicting casualties beyond anything that we've experienced in a war, major war and an increase in sexual assaults and child exploitation. You name it. <clears throat> and who is expected to deal with all of this? As other institutions fail and abdicate their responsibility, who is, res who is expected to stand their ground and pick up the pieces? The police are. And that's why I say their job, the job we ask them to do today, has never been more challenging. I believe it's important to, to understand that just like any other institution, there's always room for improvement. And over the past several decades, there's unquestionably been a lot of progress and reforms in policing that's improved policing and life for the officers, their families, and their communities. We have the most professional police in the world. Now, obviously, the event in Minneapolis was ghastly, and I haven't heard anyone attempt to defend it. And it has rightly brought about an urge to make sure we continue reforming and we finish the job. And I think that law enforcement understands and agrees that the concerns of the African American community regarding excessive use of force must be addressed. But we also have to be careful and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so extremist reactions like defund the police are trying to pull us in exactly the opposite direction of where we have to go. We have to give law enforcement more support, more training, and resources. And I think the executive order that the president signed last month strikes exactly the right balance. It's supportive of the police, and it also addresses legitimate concerns about excessive force. So our nation needs to gain a renewed appreciation of the noble work done by our police officers in protecting our communities. And I thank the President for convening this roundtable 
to highlight the good work done by our men and women in blue. Thank you, Mr. President. Maybe what we'll do is we'll go around the room and <clears throat> maybe you could introduce yourself and explain exactly what's going on. You have an incredible story, please. Hi, my name is Kamira Boyd. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. Well, on June 11th, um, 2019, um, my baby started choking on breast milk. And I start, the first thing I started to do was just run out the house and jump in the car. While leaving out of my neighborhood, Officer Kimbrough came. He was coming into the neighborhood, and he immediately pulled me over. And we immediately jumped out. And he just took her from my arms and proceeded helping her. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> Saved her. Saved, yeah, saved her. Really? Wow. <laughs> You don't hear those stories. That's why I think it's important to have a meeting like this, a little different. And it's, uh, it's the meeting that we should have about 100 times out of almost 100. This is the one because uh, the police do such a great job. And there's an example. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And uh, do you know the gentleman on your left? Uh -huh. Come on, let's go. Let's, let's tell that story, please. What yes. do you mean? Like uh, no, you know, I, you know, do you want to go ahead? Please, <laughs> yes, go ahead. Mr. President, Vice President, Attorney General Ball, thank you for having us here, other distinguished guests. My name is William Kimbrough. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. I work for the Berkeley County Sheriff's Office. Um, as Kamir was saying, on July 10th of 2019, while I was patrolling the unincorporated district of Somerville, South Carolina, um, I came across uh, Kamira and her grandmother speeding in a car. I, conducted a traffic stop on that vehicle. And as soon as those vehicles stopped, a uh, lady later identified it. Was it your grandmother, Kamara? It was my stepmom. Oh, your stepmom had jumped out of the vehicle and was frantic and said, my baby, my baby, she can't breathe. And I, I kind of stepped back and I said, what? And you know, the rest was captured on my body cam video that's since gone viral. But uh, as soon as I made entrance, over, uh, stepped up to uh, Kamara, I, I instantly asked her for the baby, my, who is now my goddaughter, and uh, oh, wow. godmom over there, Noni. Hi, Noni. Say hi, Noni. And uh, so, yeah, we've we've been blessed, and uh, me, it just it's it's been a it's been a wonderful experience. Wonderful. Great job. Thank you. Well, that's what I meant when I kiddingly said. That's what I meant when I kiddingly said, you know the gentleman on your left, because you really know him. Oh, that's okay. What <laughs> that's what I meant. And uh, great job you've done. Thank you very much on behalf of all of us. And Camira, congratulations. Thank that's you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you for you. being here, Camira. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Please, go ahead. It was about two weeks ago. Um, I was laying in bed with my other three kids. Um, and, well, I forgot to introduce myself, sorry. Um, Sarah Bohan, we have four kids and we're from Roanoke, Virginia. Um, I was laying in bed and my sister happened to be home and my husband ended up calling her and asking her to count how many kids were home. And she got up and uh, looked inside of my, my boy Spencer's room and he was not there um, and his window was open and so, we instantly saw that he was missing. And he is autistic nonverbal and doesn't really have sense of um, danger. So when he goes missing, it's like life or death. You gotta find him as fast as you possibly can. Um, so we call, instantly called the police and um, my husband rushed home from work. And they called the search dogs out um, and Within 12 minutes, they found him. He had ran up into the woods. Um, someone had spotted him sitting in the middle of the road. And he pulled over, and they tried to get him to come to him. But of course, he bolted and ran up into the woods. And um, following behind the dog, going in and out of the trees, it was actually really cool, because I could imagine him doing that exact thing of going in and out of the trees and sliding down the creeks. And uh, I'm sure he was having the time of his life, because he was free. Um, but we were able to find him, and the dog's ears perked up right when he was within 15 feet, and I yelled his name, and he sat down, and I instantly ran over to him, and we were able to carry him back, and he was safe, and the only thing he had on him was four ticks, so he was good. 
That's great. So, again, uh, the police did a great job, and the group did a great job. And so, Spencer has no sense of danger, so you would say, basically, he's very brave, okay? <laughs> view, it, view it that way. Good. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Brooke, please. Mr. President, thank you. I got to meet almost everyone. My name is Brooke Rollins. I have the extraordinary honor of serving this president as his domestic policy chief every day in this White House. And I will say there's a lot of brave people in the room, uh, probably no one more so than our two officers. But this mom not only has Mr. President her nine-year-old here, but she has her four-year-old, her three-year-old, and her 10-month-old here. And her husband, Spencer, just took them into the other room. So this is bravery at its finest for all the moms in the room who've sort of manhandled lots of children. Children. So thank you for being here, and certainly you too, and that beautiful baby girl. Um, what an honor to have you and all of you with us today. Mr. President, you mentioned New York City, Atlanta, Chicago, Philadelphia. The lack of leadership, I think, happening in some of our most ravaged cities around this country is really astonishing. But I think it's really important to note that that failure is a choice. And it is a choice, Mr. President, that I know you would never make. I have seen you now more than two and a half years stand with law enforcement, stand with the mothers and the fathers in this country who are fighting for a chance at the American dream. That dream is not possible without a law enforcement that stands for the rule of law and for safe and secure communities. So thank you so much for your leadership. Everyone here today, thank you for coming. What an honor it is to have you in your house here at the White House on this day, and special thanks to the moms who are brave enough to bring the little ones in uh, to tell their story on behalf of these amazing men and women serving in blue. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Brooke. What's more astonishing to me is that we'll call. Bill will call. Vice President will call. I'll call. You'll call leaders of these cities, Democrat leaders. And we don't care if they're Democrat or not. They happen to be in every case. But we'll call them and we'll say, do you need help? And they'll say no. I said, but you just had 40 people shot and many people killed this weekend. And they'll say, no, we're okay. And I'll say, what's that all about? And we're tired of those answers. We're tired of those answers. So thank you. To me, that's astonishing. Thank you very much, bro. Please. My name is Kenneth Bearden. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. And um, I'm here today um, because uh, I'm a man re in recovery. Um, at the age of 11 years old, I um, used substances for the first time. And uh, by the end of that summer, I had overdosed seven times already. I'm one of them people that um, once I put a minor mood-altering substance in my body, I cannot stop. Um, mm. I did not stop using alcohol or drugs until the age of 24. And um, through that time at the age of 11 to 24, I have overdosed over 30 times. And at least a dozen of them times, I've had police officers there on site administering Narcan, saving my life. And my son would not have his father today if it wasn't for the police officers, the men and the women, to administer that Narcan. Um, and just that, um, my son gets to have his dad today because of that. And um, I get to help others along the way um, because of police officers, because of the people who have helped me along the way. And I'm truly grateful to be here. And how are you doing now then? So that's, been, that's a lot of times that you had yes. difficulty. So, uh, how are you so doing? I've got six years sober now, and uh, I am one semester away. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm one semester away from having my bachelor's degree in social work. Um, oh. I have a house. I, I have full custody of my son. Um, I work for addiction recovery care as a community liaison, helping other alcoholics and addicts get into recovery and providing support for them. Um, I'm, I'm living my purpose and my passion. Today. That's fantastic, Chuck. Thank you very much. It's a, that's an equally incredible statement. You understand what you're doing now, so that's great. Six years, almost six years, that's fantastic. Sorry. Good luck. We'll see you uh, in, let's say, celebrate in 10, okay? We'll see you in 10. Yes, sir. So we'll see you in another four years, all right? Yes, that's sir. fantastic news. Thank you very much. Appreciate yes, it. Please. 
Good afternoon, Mr. President. Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Rhonda Norris. My um, story started when I was coming home from school one day. I teach. Um, and uh, I was broadsided in an intersection by a truck who ran a red light. Um, I have no recollection of the accident. Um, my first memory was a policeman reaching through the shattered window um, and checking for a pulse. And um, I was in and out of consciousness and he continuously um, urged me to stay awake and stay with him. Um, very soothing, very calm and um, was calling on his radio for an ambulance and um, first responders, which um, his, his being there sped up the process dramatically. Um, he's the one who told me we're gonna put a sheet over you to cut you out of the vehicle. Um, I, I couldn't move, I was trapped in the vehicle and also my injuries um, made me incapable of movement. Um, he also followed the ambulance to the hospital. He gathered up all my personal belongings um, that he could find at the accident and brought them to my husband at the hospital and explained to him that I had regained consciousness. Um, stayed with my husband until the um, tests were done and they said she's going to be okay. The most amazing thing to me about this state trooper is that he was off duty. He didn't have to do any of that. Right. Um, he was just happened to be at the scene of the accident and immediately responded and sped up um, my rescue. And I'm eternally grateful to him for doing that. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. It's an incredible story. So how seriously, uh, how long did it take to recover? How bad was it? I was, um, I missed five weeks of work. I um, still have some injuries that will never go away, but I am very, very thankful to okay. be here. That's a great job. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Please. Mr. President, I'm Perry Cleek, pastor of Lighthouse Baptist Church in Jonesboro, Tennessee. Good. And our church uh, watched over the last few weeks as the way that our police officers were treated all over the country. And it was all over the news about how they are such, you know, they've been demonized and disgraced and dishonored. And we got our heads together and thought, what can we do as a small church in a small town to honor our police and to let our voice be known? Their voice is loud that blame all this on police officers. The voice of small town America is seldom heard. So we just set up a little ceremony. We went through the chief of police and the public safety director, and we asked them if we could hold a public ceremony on the steps of the courthouse on Main Street in Jonesboro on July 4th at 11 o'clock in the morning and present each member of the Jonesboro Police Department with a check for $1,000. And we did that, and it shouldn't have, but it made national news. I think small towns all over America feel like we do, that we want our voice to be heard, that we love law enforcement, our local police officers, and if we can do something to support them and encourage them, then that's what we want to do. And we feel very good about what we did. Well, that's a great story. I thought you were going to tell me that they wanted to arrest you for giving them uh, <laughs> a couple of bucks, and uh, they deserve it very much. But, you know, I've, I've heard the other end of those stories also. You're not allowed to do anything. And uh, you're right about it. They've been uh, — what what the police have been going through over the last number of years, in all fairness, it's been starting, and but it's never been like this, has it? It's never been like this. It's uh, it's crazy, it's crazy, and they'll find out. It'll go the opposite direction, unfortunately, at some point. It'll go absolutely opposite when they see, and you're going to have some defunding and abolishing, and you'll see uh, numbers like nobody would ever believe, and they're going to say, "Let's get our police back as soon as we can," right? But that's great what you just said. That's a fantastic thing. Yes, sir. We, we were thankful that it's a small town and a small police department. It was only 23 employees. <laughs> so it wasn't that big a hit. That's a lot. It was a blessing to that's them. That's a lot. That's a good job. Thank and, you very Mr. much. Mr. President, I've already heard. I got a note written to the church that didn't identify the officer, but said I'm an 83-year-old widower. And one of the officers brought by a sum of money and gave to me to put back to pay my utility bills this mm. winter and told me it was a gift from Lighthouse Baptist Church. Mm. That's what one officer, and it's just a week ago, but that's what one officer did with that gift that we gave. That's great. Great stories. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. President Thank you. and Mr. Vice President for having us. My name is Debbie Wisner. I'm local. I live in Maryland. And my story is not very dramatic. It's just one that my purse was stolen. My purse. People have it happen to them. My credit cards were canceled. And my cell phone, we put a special note on it that said, if found, please call this number. Nothing came of it. A couple nights later, in the middle of the night at midnight, the phone rings. And it's a gentleman says, I found your phone. I have your phone. Would you offer a reward for it? And I said, of course. My husband said, are you nuts? And he said, I'll bring it to you. I gave him my address and hung up the phone and called our police department. Because that's who we turn to when there's a situation. Right. My husband had another idea. He wanted to do something else. But I said, no, we're going to let the police do this. There's no shooting tonight. So he, uh, the, the police came. They gave us their cell phone number. They went away around the corner and they said, when he pulls up, give us a ring, we'll be there. Sure enough, he pulled up, he comes out of the car, it's two o'clock in the morning now. And the police, two squad cars were there immediately, which is what we need in our communities. Right. And they checked him out. He did in fact find the phone and I gave him a reward and thanked my police officers, and I'm grateful that we have community policemen that are willing to come at 2 in the morning and do this yeah. silly thing. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. 2 in the morning. Why did he? Uh, that's a strange time. So you found him to be OK, even though he came at 2 in the morning? He came at 2 in the morning, but so were our policemen. Yeah, no, they were there. And that's the only reason that's we were great. OK with it. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really nice. Please. Mr. President, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I, like many others, we support you in supporting our law enforcement officers and providing safe communities. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for being here as well and your hard work. And obviously to the Attorney General, Attorney General Barr, thank you. And to law enforcement officers that are here and their families and to your staff, Mr. President. Um, although it shouldn't matter, Mr. President, I'm kind of a unique bird, if you will. Um, I'm a Democrat. I'm an elected official. I'm African-American. I have eight years or 12 years of experience in the Georgia House of Representatives, eight years as county exec. And as county exec, I've had to manage a very large, probably one of the largest police departments in the state of Georgia. But I've also had the unfortunate experience of having to meet with family members who lost a loved one from a police shooting. That was the very, probably the most difficult part of my job. But I've also had a deal on the other side where I lost two police officers in one night, among several others I lost, but I lost two in one night. By the way, they happened to, be an, to have been African American. And going to meet with their family members as well, young wives with young babies, and having to experience seeing them um, lose a loved one is, is nothing um, anybody would want to do. But I can tell you this, Mr. President. By and large, most law enforcement officers, those men and women who honorably wear their uniforms each and every day to go out, when they're running towards a situation, others are running from it. So we have to stand with them. And I'll say this, um, I have two words. Um, we need more funding for police officers, not less funding. And here's why I say that. When you look at law enforcement and the equipment that's important for them because it's protecting and save their lives as well as saving others' lives. But clearly more money is needed to buy less lethal uh, enforcement types of tools like the uh, bowler, what they call the bowler wrap. Right. We also need resources for them. Officers usually, almost always, only get the psychological exam prior of being hired, as part of the examination of getting hired. But afterwards, they're not given those type of psychological exams or assessments. And when you look at them, they've been on, a, let's say, the beat four or five years nonstop, and the number of calls they're getting, the number of situations. That's the way we can detect, are they burned out? Do we need to put them somewhere else? That's important. And, and, and finally, Mr. President, um, community policing is important, that relationship, that trust being fair, but enforcing the law. 
and most people, including black people, they want law enforcement to be out there enforcing the law. I think people just want it to be, they want them to be fair, they want them to be swift in justice. And we lost a baby girl too in Atlanta, eight years old, and it wasn't to a police officer. More people have died from the protests of Black Lives Matter than prior to that. And so sometimes it's hypocritical, it's almost as if some black lives matter, but all black lives should matter and all lives should matter. So I thank you, Mr. President, for what you're doing. Thank you. And I stand solidly with you. Thank you very much. Appreciate yes. it. Beautiful. Please. Good afternoon, uh, President Trump, Vice President Pence, and Mr. Barr, and distinguished guests. I thank you for this opportunity to share our family's uh, story. Eight years ago, our 15-year-old daughter was trafficked by MS-13 gang members. Um, she was trafficked over a year and a half time period uh, throughout the DMV area. Law enforcement played a fundamental role in the rescue and the recovery of our daughter, and were also vital in the protection and safety of our family, both then and now. Initially, the officers handling our case, albeit well-intentioned, were not trauma-informed and not able to differentiate a runaway teen from a victim of human trafficking. Once we came in contact with trained personnel, former uh, detective Bill Wolf, our situation improved. We need to provide resources and training to law enforcement to properly address only, not only the offenders, but also to the victims and to their families. Because of Mr. Wolf's expertise in this area, we were able to relocate our family to a safe location. We were able to get our daughter the proper resources and help so that she could heal and move on for her life. Um, the law enforcement is crucial to the rescue uh, to the victims of human trafficking, and I believe we should support them with everything we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great story. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. President, for convening this listening session. And uh, thank you for all the, the passion and you know, being able to share your stories here um, on national TV you know, with the president, because it's really important. Um, there's so many people who don't get a chance to have their voice lifted. And having this opportunity to tell your story um, to a president that's not only going to listen to it, but take action is extremely important to the work that we do. Um, and I want you all to know that um, as you go back home, we're, we're still there with you and we're willing to come and do all we can to help create safer communities. Um, since day one, this president's been really focused on that in a unique way. Um, I've spent some time on the road um, and uh, with my colleague Scott Turner, uh, trying to get local leadership to work with us um, to not only change those communities, but empower people. Um, but having these sessions here is, is extremely important because most people don't know, some people don't know the pain that you all go through. Um, and so having that story be told um, to millions of people is extremely important. But I think what's most important is that um, we take this session here and create action, work with our police department, empower our police department, empower our families so that we can change what's happened over the last 20 years. There's, there's it's no reason for places um, across the country in America to have more deaths than a war over in Iraq or Afghanistan. You know, that's, that's not the country that we're about, and uh, this president won't stand for it. And so thank you so much for your president, you. Mr. President, for your leadership. Thank you very much. You're doing a great job, too. Please. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm basically here in support of my daughter-in-law and my grandchildren. But um, I would like to say a personal thank you to Officer Reese here for saving my grandson. I will never forget it, and I will always be grateful. And I would also like to add that I'm a state employee. I work in the city of Atlanta, and I have seen a drastic change in law enforcement coverage in that area. And I see the difference when law enforcement is not visible on the streets. So we've had our challenges there, and it's it's peaceful now, 
but when there is a lack of law enforcement in, within a community, civility breaks down and crime increases. And I don't have any answers to any solutions, but I can just speak on the fact that I have experienced it over the past three or four months. And I thank you for your invitation here and for your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mr. President, Vice President, Attorney General, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. It's truly an honor to be here. Um, I'm Deputy Corey Reese with Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. I have uh, been a deputy there for going on three years now. Uh, last month in June, I was uh, staying with my wife at a uh, Hampton Inn in uh, Tampa, off, off duty of course, I work in Palm Beach County, this is Tampa. Um, we were in the room relaxing and um, I could hear a, uh, a lady in the hallway screaming for help. And so I went outside to see what was going on and uh, the young lady to my left here was on the floor clutching the child in her arms. She was screaming for help, the child was crying and there was a man standing above them grabbing at her and the child. Now, my first thought was it was a domestic situation, but clearly there was something going, something wasn't right with the situation, so I separated him, and she said that she doesn't know him and he was trying to take her child. And more and more people came pouring out of their rooms and were saying the same thing, so I immediately got him separated I had him sit down in the hallway and I had someone else call uh, Tampa PD and they arrived and I, at that point I just was keeping the peace between everybody because there were some people getting quite aggressive, you know, with, with him. You know, it's not, you know, the right time. You know, you have to let law enforcement handle it. You know, it's not a time to take matters in your own hands. So at that point it was mostly peacekeeping, but, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't think it would be as, as big of a deal as it ended up being until, you know, the next day some people in the hallway were like, the video's gone viral, it's like a million views, and, and then I'm getting a call saying I'm invited to the White House. I mean, it just, it was completely unexpected. Um, you know, I just, just doing what, you know, what I was trained to do, what I was told to do, you know, just being there, right time, right place, and that's it. Um, again, thank you for having me here. It's called natural instinct, right? More than anything else, thank you very much. Great job. Appreciate it. Well, you've said it all. So that's a case that's still going now? Still going? Well, as far as the law, um, the hotel. I see. The, our hotel room with the key. Uh, and, that, and that he came in and tried to take him away. Oh, well, good luck with it. Good luck. Beautiful guy, too. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay, that's uh, just a few stories of the thousands and thousands of stories that we could tell. And we'll probably be doing this again, but the police. Uh, they do a great job. They do a fantastic job, and they don't get the kind of uh, — I, I will say this. The people of this country appreciate the police. They appreciate all they've done. You don't see that if you watch the news, for the most part. You don't see things like this, but they've done a fantastic job. Everybody here is a witness to that, and we see it a lot. The Attorney General sees it every day, but we see it a lot, and uh, I just want to thank the Various police departments, law enforcement, they've done an incredible job in this country. Where they're allowed to do their work, they really do a job. So thank you all very much for being here. Good luck with your case. <laughs> and really, terrific job, everybody. Terrific job. Thank you.
Would anybody from the media like to ask anybody a question uh, here? Steve, go ahead, please. Well, I was going to ask you about if you're in a good place with Dr. Fauci. There's been some criticism of him over the last couple of days. Do you still appreciate his advice? Well, I have a very good relationship with Dr. Fauci. I've had for a long time, right from the beginning. I find him to be a very nice person. I don't always agree with him. I closed the border, as you know, to China. I closed — I did the ban on China, heavily infected. And we saved tens of thousands of lives. And Dr. Fauci will admit that. It was a good decision. It was very early. That was in January, uh, long before it was uh, thought of as the right thing to do. I also closed the borders to Europe when Italy and a couple of other countries over there — France, certainly, Spain — they were having a lot of problems. I closed the borders very early shortly after I did with China. So we saved a lot of lives, so we made a lot of good decisions. But, uh, no, I get along with them very well. I like them, personally. Yeah, please. President, are, are you going to pardon Michael Flynn? I can't hear you. Are you going to pardon Michael Flynn? Well, he's got a case going on right now. I think he would — I don't know this for a fact, but uh, I think he's doing very well with respect to his case. I hope that he's going to be able to win it. And I don't have a decision to make until I find out what's going to happen. But I think he was uh, persecuted. Uh, he didn't lie. Turned out he didn't lie. The FBI said he didn't lie. I think he was persecuted, and nobody understands what's going on with the judge. The Justice Department, which is so capable, they decided to take a view on it, and they uh, they decided that uh, he should be they, — they were going to drop the case. So he's — right now, meaning his lawyers and him — are embroiled in, uh, hopefully, the final stages of what should have never happened. They treated him very unfairly, as they have many people on this side. Yeah, please. President Trump, you've said many times that the number of coronavirus cases is going up because testing is increasing. That's right. Do you acknowledge that it's going up for other reasons, too? For example, that it's actually spreading? And what are you going to do to stop the spread? Well, you know that we have one of the lowest mortality rates anywhere. If you know uh, Biden and Obama stopped their testing, they just stopped it. You probably know that. I'm sure you don't want to report it. But uh, they stopped testing. Uh, right in the middle, they just went — no more testing. And uh, on a much lesser problem than the problem that we have, obviously, with respect to uh, — this is the worst thing that's happened since probably 1917. This is a very bad — all over the world, it's 188 countries right now. But, no, we are — we test more than anybody, by far. And when you test, you create cases. So we've created cases. Uh, I can tell you some countries, they test when somebody walks into a hospital sick or walks into maybe a doctor's office, but usually a hospital. That's the testing they do, so they don't have cases. Whereas we do, we have all of these cases, so, you know, it's a double-edged sword. At the same time, we have the lowest mortality, or just about the lowest mortality in the world. Uh, we're doing a great job. We're doing very well with vaccines, and we're doing very, very well with therapeutics. And I think we're going to have some very good information coming out soon. But we have the best and certainly uh, uh, the biggest — by far the biggest — testing program anywhere in the world. If you tested China or Russia or any of the larger countries, if you just tested uh, India, as an example, the way we test, you'd see numbers that would be uh, very surprising. Brazil, too. You know, Brazil's going through a big problem. But they don't do testing like we do. So we uh, do the testing, and uh, by doing the testing, we have tremendous numbers of cases. If we didn't do the — as an example, we've done 45 million tests. If we did half that number, you'd have half the cases, probably, around that number. If we did — if we did another half of that, you'd have half the numbers. Everyone would be saying, oh, we're doing so well on cases. But when I see it reported in the night, you can check me out on this. I mean, they always talk about — they're always talking about uh, cases, the number of cases. Well. It is a big factor that we do — we have a lot of cases because we have a lot of testing, far more than any other country in the world. And it's also the best testing. Yeah, please. Yeah, the federal government is set to resume federal executions for the first time in more than a decade, potentially as soon as a couple of hours from now. Are you monitoring the last-minute appeals on that case? Well, and I think what I'm going to do is easy? allow that to uh, be answered by our Attorney General. Do you mind, Bill? Yes, sir. We, we obviously monitor uh, the appellate process. And, Mr. President, have you given any 
consideration to using your clemency powers to stop these executions and commute them to life sentences? Well, I've, I've looked at it very strongly. And in this particular case, I'm dealing with uh, Bill and all of the people at Justice. And it's always tough. You're talking about the death penalty. But when you talk about people that did what this particular person did, that's tough also. Uh, so we're going to see what happens. Right now, they have a stay, I believe, right? They have a stay. And we'll let the courts determine the final outcome. And that's what's going to happen, OK? Um, you're asking Americans to have full faith in law enforcement. How do you respond to critics who say you undermined your own federal law enforcement agency, the DOJ, when you commuted the sentence of Roger Stone? Well, if you look uh, back on it, uh, this was an investigation that should have never taken place. Uh, you have guys like Comey. You have uh, McCabe. You have Strook. You have uh, his lover, Lisa Page. You have all of these people running around. You have Brennan and Clapper, who lied to Congress. You have uh, many, many people. You have people that change documents going into the FISA courts. And uh, it's a terrible thing. And this is an investigation that they said should have ended before it started. It shouldn't have started. And if it did, it should have ended immediately, because they found, as you know as well as I do, they found nothing initially, but it went on for two years or longer. And uh, now I did. I'm getting rave reviews for what I did for Roger Stone. And he, frankly, is going to go and now appeal his case. He had a jury for a woman who hated Roger Stone and uh, who hated probably me. But she went on a false pretense. And he wasn't given a fair trial. He wasn't — it's not a fair trial. He wasn't given another trial. He should have been given another trial. Uh, I won't say more. I won't talk about the judge. I'm not going to — why would I ever talk about a judge? But uh, this was a judge that gave, I believe, solitary confinement to Paul Manafort. Al Capone didn't have solitary confinement. So these are things that happened. And uh, if you look at President Bush, President Clinton, President Obama, take a look at what they did. Uh, frankly, it's a very unfair — Roger Stone was treated very unfairly, in my opinion. And so were many others on this side. In the meantime, you have the other ones who are admitted lying before — they admitted they lied before Congress. They leaked. They leaked classified information, which is something you just can't do. And what are they doing? So we'll see what happens. But, no, we're, we're getting rave reviews for what I did, OK? Are you, are you going to be able to hold the convention in Jacksonville with, with all this virus spread? Well, we're going to see it built up a little bit, but we're going to do something that will be great. We think we're doing very well. We had some poll numbers a little while ago that are great. You know, it's the same story. It's uh, suppression polls that we had in 2016, phony polls. Uh, fake news, phony polls, same thing. And we're doing very well. We're doing well in Georgia. We're doing well in Texas. I read uh, where I was one point up in Texas. I'm not one point up in Texas. We're many points up. I saved the oil industry. Two months ago, I saved the oil industry. They would have been — I created it. We became number one. We have millions of jobs. And we saved it, so Texas is not going to have to let go of millions and millions of people. Oklahoma, uh, North Dakota, many states. Uh, we have — we're at $40 a barrel, and yet you can buy gasoline for under $2. Nobody's ever seen like that. So we have the biggest energy in the world. We're number one in oil, as you know, oil and gas by far. We're now number one in the world. And we would have had millions of people out of work. I saved it. And then they say, I'm leading by one point in Texas. They said it last time, too. They said, Texas is too close to call. This was, like, three months before the election. And then I won Texas in a blowout. They called it the minute the polls closed. They said that about Utah. They said that about Georgia. They said the same thing. That Georgia's, oh, we can't — it's too close. They'll never be able to determine. We'll have to wait till election night. On election night, uh, two seconds after the poll closed, they called Georgia. So, you know, it's the same thing. We have the same thing. They're phony polls. They're suppression polls. But to think that uh, after saving the oil and gas business and millions and millions of jobs — I'm leading Texas by one point. I don't think so. Go ahead. Is the China uh, phase one deal still intact, or is it uh, — do you see it in jeopardy? It's intact. Intact? it's intact. But I'm uh, — I'm, uh, I think what China has done to the world with what took place, the China plague, you can call it the China virus. You can call it whatever you want to call it. It's about 20 different names. Uh, what they did to the world should not be forgotten. 
but it's intact. They're buying. Whether they buy or not, that's up to them. They're buying. Yes, President, uh, Los Angeles just announced that they are delaying the opening of their schools. New York already said they were going to delay them. Other school districts are giving parents the choice whether to send their kids to school or not. What do you tell parents who look at this, who look at Arizona, where a school teacher recently died teaching summer school, parents who are worried about uh, the safety of their children in public yeah, schools? Yeah, schools should be opened. Schools should be opened. If these kids want to go to school. You're losing a lot of lives by keeping things closed. We did the right thing. We saved millions of lives. We saved millions of lives when we did the initial closure. Had we not done what we did, we would have had two to — Mike and I were talking about it before — two to three million lives lost. Uh, but we did that, so we're at about 135,000, and we'll be at somewhat higher than that by the time it — it ends. Uh, and again, the vaccines are happening and the therapeutics are happening, but I'm not even talking about that. So we'll be at a somewhat higher — but we would have lost two million, three million lives had we not done it. Uh, now we understand it also. We understand there are certain vulnerabilities. Young children — I was with uh, — talking to Governor Murphy, and uh, they have thousands of lives. I won't even say how many. Just thousands of lives. Hard to believe in New Jersey. And he said there was only one life that was 18 or younger. One person died, and that was a person — a young man that had some medical difficulty. Uh, so when you think of that with thousands of lives and you have one person that was under 18, uh, that's something that tells you, for some reason, I guess the immune system is much stronger with young people uh, than it is for others. So we have to watch uh, the group that does have the difficulty, does have the problem. We all know what that is. We all know who they are, especially if they have a medical problem. If they have a medical problem, diabetes or heart or anything, uh, it's a — it's a big problem. But we're being very careful. But we have to open the schools. Would you agree with that? Do you agree? Yeah. We have to open the schools. We have to get them open. And uh, I think there's a lot of politics going along. I think they think they'll do better if they can keep the schools closed in the election. I don't think it's going to help them, frankly. But I think they feel that by keeping schools closed, that's a bad thing for the country, and therefore, that's a uh, good thing for them. But uh, — they're the ones whose city's burning. I mean, can you imagine if the country was run like Chicago and like New York and like some of these other Democrat, super-radical left cities are run? Uh, you wouldn't have a country for very long, and the economy would crash. So we just set a brand-new record today on NASDAQ again. This is now, I think, the 18th time since — and this is since after the problem. So we have a new stock market high for NASDAQ, and the other ones are getting very close. When I came here, the stock market was up almost 500 points today. The economy is rebuilding. Jobs are being produced at a record pace. We've never had a pace like this. And I will tell you, if uh, Biden got in, this economy would be destroyed. You know, he was in — he was in office for 48 years, and what he did was not great. Almost every decision was a wrong decision. And now he's going to come in and try and help us. We didn't need any help. We built the greatest economy in history, greatest economy we've ever had, the greatest economy the world has ever seen. And then the plague came in from China, and we started oh, — we did the right thing. We had to close it down. Now we're opening it up. He can't do it. He doesn't have the capability to do it. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.